and so I get to see him and his wife every year at, at the uh, ICMA conference. And by the way, I want to welcome his wife, Kay. She's sitting up over here. And um, I think
But basically, um, when I came here, I did look at different alternatives. Um, I filled out the uh, application when I came to BYU initially and said uh, I was interested in engineering, but that was just basically to get into the, into the door. Um, then I went through the College of Communications and found marketing and found that was a way to make a lot of money. Um, but I also had a class in psychology and I knew that psychiatrists made a lot of money. So then I was going like this. Well, as mentioned, um, shortly after we got married, then Kay found out that she was pregnant and then with the first set of twins. So I was motivated to move forward in my career and choose the path. Uh, I decided business management actually was the way that I wanted to go. So I started taking a lot of business management classes. I wanted to get an MBA. I figured that's the place you need to go need to be able to figure out how to manage a corporation. And that would do it for me. So that was my goal, started taking business management classes. Well, um, after I filled out the core requirements, I went up to the college and I applied. And they said, well, what's your career goals? I said, I want to get an MBA. They said, well, you know what? Um, if you want to get an MBA, you got to get your undergraduate in something else. Because you can take the same classes in the MBA, MBA program that you'd be taking in, or I mean in the that would have been useful information. <laughs> but I didn't know that. Anyway, um, I did kind of shop around and found through the College of Communication. They required all those same uh, undergraduate classes uh, for the uh, broadcast sales management. So there it was, uh, communications back into business management, but something different so I could still go into the MBA program. So how to get to the MBA program? <laughs> I did graduate uh, from the College of Communications, went to work for a radio station and TV stations. Um, worked out there basically for about a year, did some internships and those kind of things as well. Uh, what I discovered was that, uh, you know, basically what they were all about was trying to sell airtime. They were, and I got an opportunity to really sit down with CEOs of major corporations here inside the Salt Lake Valley and uh, pro area and find out what they were all about. Why is it that, you know, what is, why, why does your company exist? What are you really trying to do? And they were really trying to push product. And they were just trying to increase self, shelf space and those kind of things. And uh, so as I went through that, kind of, you know, became a little disenfranchised with the business community, I guess you could say. Their, their goals were not always necessarily, um, in my mind, appropriate. Um, so, what do I do with this? Now I've got a whole career is going towards an MBA program. Um, so I did hear about the MP from public administration. And uh, I was been a patriot and felt like maybe local government was the way to go, but still, got lots of kids on the way. And at this time, I've had the second set of twins, so i got to find a way to feed them, we got to get this done. Um, and Short story, I guess. Um, a lot of prayer went into the city. And that's terrible, isn't it? I got an answer from Andrew Bach. But this is where I should feel, so here I am. And I hope that you use the Spirit to guide you in the direction you're going as well. Especially in the MPA program, because if you decide to be a city manager and administrator, uh, the press is not going to be kind. Uh, the citizens uh, in your community are not going to always be kind to you. Um, you're going to be doing uh, things that are important, um, things to build your community. But again, there's always two sides to the story. Uh, county administrator right now, he has his face in the paper all the time. Um, in fact, uh, national attention from time to time. Uh, his wife, gets accosted in the store. Um, his children, when they go to school, um, other children say things to him, uh, inappropriate things. So, it's not all roses. But, again, what we're doing is important to the community. Um, and we are guiding communities, and we are building them. Um, so, I applaud you for your decision, but just be aware that, uh, you know, you're not going to be filthy, sink, and rich. Uh, but you are going to have an opportunity to develop and build your community. Um, and for me, it's been well worth the journey.
So if you look at, uh, well, one other interesting story, I'm not going to take too long with this, but after I applied uh, to the MPA program, then uh, you had to take the, I can't remember, was it an LSAT test? GMAT. I had to take the GMAT test. So the GMAT test that I had to take actually fell on the opening of Deer Hunt. Um, and that was the only one I could take before program before the deadline for application. But there was one that was going to happen right after that deadline. So um, I went in and talked to folks and basically I ended up going near him. <laughs> <laughs> but I did take the test after the deadline and it was still accepted. So. <laughs> um, so that's, I think that's probably what happened. Um, I did an internship at Draper City and then went to work for Jackson County. And I put it on my uh, bio uh, all the job titles that I've had, so I hope that answers the question why I'm still in Jackson County. It was kind of an interesting experience just because I went there, I promised two years, uh, ended up, I, I thought in my mind I can give you three, you know, and have enough experience to move on. The goal was really to be a city manager and administrator. Um, and after about two years, then my boss, the county administrator, um, came in and saw the job opportunities bulletin on my desk, got a little bit antsy, um, and he gave me a raise, gave me a new class classification. So that's how it worked. And every time I got to close to that top step, then I got another position. Um, so all those titles basically got to the point I am now, um, frankly, after about the third increase, then I was making as much as the small city managers. Um, after about the fourth one, I was making as much as the larger cities. Um, and now I would have to be a city manager in a fairly large community in order to make the same salary. Okay. And frankly, the benefit of where I am now, in my face, is an indicator. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows who my wife is. <laughs> <laughs> in the community. Um, the friends that I have um, have, have had for 23 years, uh, they still can't remember whether I work for the county or the city. Um, I don't have evening meetings. The board of commissioners don't call me. Um, in fact, when I go on vacation, I really don't take my cell phone with me. Uh, the county administrator has to do all those things. Right? So, I've kind of got the pay. Uh, but I don't have all the head. So, and that's good for me. I like it. Um, and like I said, I'm making enough money that uh, my family uh, is comfortable. There was a, position, a, a time when I thought, okay, it's time to go. Uh, time to move on to another community. Uh, start floating applications out there. And uh, really, it was gonna, I was invited to interview. And uh, I said, okay. I sat down and talked with my wife and said, okay, I'm going to go interview this place. It's going to be okay with you because if they offer me, um, you know, we don't want to waste their time. I want to be able to meet my commitment to them and go there. And she said, well, if you want to interview there and go to work there, that's fine, but you know where I live, just send a check. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're still in Medford. <laughs> as long as she's happy with us. All right. Um, when I was in the MPA program, I heard a lot about city management, uh, city structure, that kind of thing, but I heard very little bit of, little, uh, about county, county government. So I thought it'd be important to show you a little bit about that. So if we can show what was up there. There's our organizational structure. The thing that's different about counties, you may or may not know, is um, that these little boxes right here. Okay, assessor, clerk, district attorney, justice court, sheriff, and surveyor. They're all elected positions. They're all department directors. That makes it kind of difficult sometimes to deal with them just because they've got uh, a mandate from the citizens that they're going to run their department. So I can't go in if they're doing a poor job and fire them. Um, and frankly, some of those positions, especially the assessor.
professor, clerk, um, surveyor, those positions and their job responsibilities are so uh, so tied down by the Oregon Revised Statutes or Oregon Law that uh, they really don't have any independent judgment. Okay, so they really should be, in my opinion, appointed positions. And in fact, the commissioners feel that way. We put it on the ballot, and we keep getting it. It keeps getting rejected because the citizens feel like they need to be able to appoint those positions. Um, they feel like. You know, we're not we're not going to give that authority to the county commissioners to appoint those positions. We want to have that voice. But the interesting thing is, is uh, the assessor um, he just left office. We had another one come in. He had, and I'm not necessarily here trying to talk talk down about elected officials because they do a great job, and I certainly admire them. But he had more complaints, uh, grievances in his program in his department management. Um, he finally allowed us to come in and start helping him to get his department together and uh, he eventually got frustrated left office and uh, one of the guys that was in the office before came up, he was appointed by the Board of Commissioners and then the electorate elected him. See, but nobody knew, no, the, the community did not know what was going on in his office. They had no idea what poor management was. Right? And that word doesn't that's the challenge of having an elected official in your organization. And like I said, you can see that we deal with a couple of them. Now, what control do we have over those elected officials? Um, we set the budget. Okay? So the Board of Commissioners has the authority to approve their budget. So for the assessor, actually, what we ended up telling him was, look, we have the authority to contract that service out to the state. So if you don't kind of comply with what it is that we want to do, we'll take away your department, and give that to the state, and you'll be an elected assessor with nothing to do. And by the way, we also control the salary. The salary committee comes in, reviews their salary, and sets that. So we do have some levers we can pull there, but again, um, in order for them to leave office, they have to be voted out. So again, the assessor, the clerk, the district attorney. District attorney is actually uh, an appointed position initially by the state. So he's a state employee, but his staff is all county employee. Uh, Justice Court is a judge, and the sheriff obviously is in charge. And with the sheriff, one of the things that's important to know about the sheriff, and it's the same issue with your uh, local cities, city government. That's going to be one of your biggest bones of contention, <coughs> the places that you really have to get along, um, because they have a lot of power. And they have uh, control over a fairly, fairly large piece of the budget, and they carry guns. <laughs> <laughs> um, the surveyor, again, that's one of those positions that um, you know, is pretty small. Again, Everything is mandated by the state as to what they can do. They can't decide to accept one plat and not accept another plat. They have to review it for accuracy, sign it off of this. But still, it is like. All right. So, what was appealing to me, though, about Jackson County, and one of the things you have to understand, is uh, we have a home rule charter. And that's important because if you don't have a home rule charter, then you basically have to function under the state statutes. Right? So under state statute, then you have three judges who are elected. Right? And basically all the departments report to those three judges, except for those elected officials. And those elected officials are set up by uh, the charter and by the state statute. Right? Um, but each of these departments report separately so they'll divide up the organization, and those departments will report directly to them, and there's no communication between them. And usually what ends up happening is they end up trying to protect their turf and trying to grow their, their, uh, their territory. Um, so having a home room rule charter, though, then basically those board of commissioners appoint a county administrator, and then the county administrator is responsible for all of these elections, or I mean all of these so, um, and we also have, by that home rule charter, we have the ability to set our own uh, codified ordinances. So we can write our own laws for the local government, and 
and we don't have to just rely on the stick one. Okay? It's an important thing to look at. Um, and it was nice to have an organization with three commissioners who are uh, elected, but they're elected to full-time positions, and they are full salary. Right? So they're not getting 50 bucks a month to come to the board meetings, those kind of things. They're full, fully salaried, full-time positions, um, what, which means that basically um, all their meetings are during the day. So nice thing to me. I don't have to go to night meetings. Right? When you're working for a city government, then most of those appointed uh, your city council is going to be, uh, they're going to be part-time, and they're going to get that $500 per diem per month in order to serve on that position, or in that position. Um, and all their meetings are going to be meeting. So the amount of paperwork that you have to generate each week for the board agenda is item that's on there, you have to communicate fully with them those issues with paper. Um, you do have an opportunity to meet with them usually before uh, that meeting where they'll approve those agenda items, but with the Board of Commissioners, we have a meeting, we sit down and talk with them, um, we highlight the issues, we let them discuss those issues with us. Um, we have a meeting on Tuesday where we do basically a study session and it's just talking about their issues. All the issues have to be set out on the agenda, but basically all those, um, they can sit there and we can talk about any issue in depth that they want to talk about. And we have a Wednesday meeting, again during the day, where they approve all their board orders. Um, and that's where we really kind of do the business. Um, and then that's in front of the cameras and everybody else. And then on Thursday, we have a study session with them um, a staff meeting, so we talk about their agendas um, and the things that are going to come up on the next Wednesday's agenda. Okay. So it works pretty slick, pretty smooth. Um, and again, that's, that's one of the benefits and one of the things that's going to be important to you to look at um, as you go out into the job world to find um, that organizational structure that fits the life that you want to lead. If you're okay going to those evening meetings, that's great. Do that. Um, again, the Home Rule Charter established the position of County Administrator, and these are some of the departments that we have under it. Airport, County does run the airport in Medford, so if you fly into Medford International Airport, that's Jackson County. Uh, community Justice is parole and probation. County Council is the County Lawyers. We have a team of four County Lawyers, County Administration, and that includes um, a lot of things, facility maintenance, resources, um, um, so on and so forth. Uh, finance, that's actually finance and treasury, internal service department, uh, development services, which is our planning, um, and zoning, health and human services, uh, information technology, that's of course the computers, computer systems, phone systems, roads and parks, and uh, so I hope that kind of helps you understand what counties are about or the county structure and the difference between county structures and city structures. For the most part, under a city, then you would see the, um, you'd see the elected board up there, and then you'd see a, a city manager right there, and then you would see all of these departments under that city manager. So are there questions about that? Are the elected positions partisan or nonpartisan? Because I think in Solid County and in most places in Utah, they're partisan positions, but I don't know if it's the same in Oregon. Um, the elected officials for this position are. Okay. The commissioners are. The uh, surveyor is not. Justice Court is not. Uh, clerk, no, the assessor is not. The clerk is district attorney and the sheriff. Other questions about that? Okay, the organizational structure does work pretty well, like I said, for the most part. And really, um, I talked about some of the disadvantages having those elected officials in there, but really, um, for the most part, when they come on board, they're really excited. Uh, they want to do a good job. 
and for the most part they really do a, a good job. They follow the county policy and procedures. Um, when they have issues with discipline, discharge, that kind of thing, they work closely with human resources. Um, the sheriff is coming into the fold. Uh, <laughs> they can do their own internal investigations and require to do those, those uh, as well. But now we basically got them to a position where HR works closely with them as well. So, other questions about the difference between cities and, and counties as far as they, they function? You'll find a lot of different organizational structures in counties because some places they actually even do um, the school system. So you'll have this big chunk of organization over there that's county schools, and then you'll have the part over here that's basically taking care of these Um, well, with that, then we'll, we'll go over to a presentation that I usually give on a new employee orientation. Just talks a little bit about the budget for the county. And I'm told if I click on this, get it right there. Click on that. We're good. All right. So this is one of the things that uh, I learned when I was here in the MPA program. The difference between operating revenue, operating expansion. Um, dedicated, non-dedicated revenue. So this is the story. This is Jackson County's budget for 12-13. As you can see, blue up there, 12 percent. That's the non-dedicated operating money. So that is the part that the board of commissioners, the budget committee, can really play. With. Right. This portion right here, 38 percent. That's dedicated operating revenue. So you can see for Jackson County, about half of the budget is operating revenue, half of it is non-operating revenue. Why is this an important concept? Well, when you're trying to put together your organizational structure, when you're trying to fund your organization, you have to know whether your revenue is operating or non-operating. Maybe you can already tell me what the difference is between and what it is that you should fund um, with operating revenue or with operating revenue. bills go out in November. We know about how much we're going to get in November. We know how much we're going to get in a quarter after that, a quarter after that, pretty much. Right? So we can take that money and we can hire people. Right? We can pay our gas bill or electric bill because we know about how much that, that's going to be, how much it's going to bring. Um, we don't want to fund things that, uh, or, or treat operating revenue or not operating revenue is operating revenue. For example, people say, well, you've got enough reserves in the bank, why don't you just take that reserve and hire people? Well, if you do that, then as soon as you get done spending that in reserves, you have to hire people. That's what I'm doing. All right, so that works in the short run, but it's very short, short side. Unless you have a plan. Um, so just be aware of that. And in fact, that concept right there um, basically, and, and keeping track of that concept, that single concept, is the reason I'm at Jackson County, and basically the reason that I'm in the position I'm in. Because I've tracked that, and I've held people's feet to the fire, and helped them understand, operating revenue, that's operating revenue, this is how we're going to spend it. This is not operating revenue, this is not how we're going to spend it. Okay? Very important concept. All right, so what's that non-operating revenue? Non-operating revenue is uh, the giving fund balance. So, um, and you'll learn about budget laws. Uh, but basically, that unappropriate ending fund balance or beginning fund balance is the same thing as owner's equity. Um, so it's cash balances that came forward from the prior years. Um, and that money, again, one-time money, when you spend it, it's gone for the most part. How do we get it? Where does it come from? Um, you'll have this discussion if you haven't already, interest income. And why wouldn't you include interest income in your operating revenue? 
because usually it goes like this. Right? right now it's just like this. Right? Um, we're getting just about 1% uh, interest off of our uh, fund balances, but there were times when literally um, we would fluctuate and we would go from 5.5% to 2.5% a week. Don't want to get into the position of calling your finance director and maybe find out how many people could come to work. Um, also, in Oregon, it's against the law to spend, to overexpend your budget. And in fact, uh, if the department overexpends their budget, they're personally liable to pay it back. Um, you should all say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, what that means is the county can't pay it back for them. That means if they overexpend their budget by $100,000, they're going to be working for the county for free for a year. Okay? Um, so, they really pay attention to that. They don't overexpend their budget. Usually they bring in more revenue than they budget because you budget conservatively, right? Because you have the people in the budget department who are making sure that they budget conservatively on their revenues and they're matching up their operating revenues and operating expenditure. Or they know the difference between that and how much general fund that they're going to have to have in order to balance their budgets. Right? Um, so, that money generally they over, over collect, they underspend, that money gets kind of scooped it, up and dumped the next year into that beginning fund balance. Again, you can't depend on the amount of money that they're going to underspend because you don't want to balance your budget or hire people on that amount each year because it varies significantly. Um, when you're putting your budget together, it's generally 18, in, 18 months in advance of the time that you're going to end your budget. Right? So, just keep in mind, you have to guess that far out of what your expenditures are going to be and what's going to happen. So, again, you don't want to use that money for those kind of purposes. Okay? So, that's, our, that's basically it. This portion goes with that portion. So, we've got fund balances in all of our funds. And that's, I think, important because you need enough revenue in the bank in order to get yourself from the beginning of the year until you make your cash starts coming in. So for Jackson County, the general fund, we need about $10 million to get us from July 1, which is the beginning of our fiscal year, to November when that property tax comes in. Right? If we don't have that in the bank, July 1, then we have to go to the bank and borrow. And you don't want to get into that situation. So you want to have that reserve sitting there so you can use it for cash. Questions about that? Um, dedicated versus non-dedicated. The dedicated money comes to us with a specific purpose. So, for example, um, our Health and Human Services Department, for the most part, is funded by uh, contracts from the state. They give us a number of clients, developmentally disabled folks, um, so on and so forth, and we are in charge of their lives. When we are placed in charge of their lives, then they give us money to take care of them. All right. um, and basically, we're responsible to take that money, spend it to take care of those people and report back to them, again, by contract. So we can't just take that money and spend it on the sheriff's department, right? Because there's a contractual requirement. Uh, a good example of this, and one of the things that's kind of important and the reason it's important to communicate this, this to your citizens and to your employees um, dedicated versus non-dedicated revenue is the libraries. So in Jackson County, we floated a bond, um, the citizens voted, they said, we want new libraries or we want to rebuild libraries. So we did. We floated that bond, $38 million to build libraries. And we actually ended up building 12 libraries for that amount. Um, but while we were in the middle of building those libraries, then the federal government basically um, through a wrench at us. Um, and you don't have any idea what ONC revenue is, but if you know what tilt money is, payment in lieu of taxes, it's kind of that, um, and maybe we'll get into some of that um, when we're further into the slideshow here. Right? But anyway, basically they broke the deal. So there we went, and that was operating money. That was money that was coming into us regularly. We were using that to support our services. So they stopped paying it to us. We had, didn't have enough money to keep the libraries open. So, 
laid off all the employees, sent them home. We were still building libraries. So there we were, building new libraries, and they were closed. Right? And people said, are you nuts? What are you doing? Just take some of that money that you're using to build them and keep our libraries open. That would make sense, right? But that money that came to us was dedicated to a specific purpose. And had we even stopped building libraries, then it would have been against the law because we had a mandate from the citizens. When they voted for that, we want new libraries. So there we are, building the new libraries, and then we can't keep them open. Questions? Could you not like put that up to a vote and say that like, hey, we have the X amount of libraries up to build and this much money could we stop building and use that money for something else? Or is that not an option either? Not an option. So once you have that mandate, we sold the bonds, we were there. gave them a couple opportunities, of course, to, to uh, fund uh, measures that would temporarily kept the libraries open and those were all key. So we did do that action. Okay. Um, another good example of that, uh, we have a greenway trail and it goes down basically, it's from Ashland to Central Point, that's about 35 miles. And that, that path runs inside and outside of the road right of way. Well, with our um, road fund, then that's dedicated revenue. We can spend that money inside the road right of way. So anytime that path goes inside the road right of way, we can use those road funds to maintain it. Anytime it goes out, we can. So when you ride your bike down the Greenway Trail in, in Oregon, um, then you'll notice that some parts are in very good repair and some parts are not in such good repair. And that's the reason it's dedicated. Dedicated revenue on one side, got to find grants, gifts, donations. So, yeah, trying to fill the budget, $360 million. It's actually a lot of money. Um, and we'll always have that. <laughs> the question is, is what kind of services can we provide for them? So next. There we go. Okay. So this is the important part of the budget. Uh, non-dedicated budget, or non-dedicated, that's that portion right there. 23% of our operating budget, and this part, portion dedicated 77%. So, when people come up to the Board of Commissioners and they say we want these services, and you're not providing enough of those services, then that's the pie that we have to look at. They could stand out on the corner and hand that out, technically, if they wanted to, because it's not dedicated. It comes to us, we do not even want it. This portion is all on our contract. So when they look at the budget, and it's the same thing for cities and counties. When they look at the budget, they have to look at this flip. They can do anything they want. Okay, questions about that? Non-dedicated portion, dedicated portion, grand total. So you see, with our total budget, we're actually down to the amount. And again, this is the amount that we can hire employees, gas, electric. Right, go ahead. What are some examples of things you use non-dedicated funds for? Good question. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Whoops. What's going on here? Go back to home and skip. That's it. That's it. So this is where we spend our non-dedicated operating hours. Um, as you can see right here, 69%. I talked to you earlier about the sheriff and the power. There it is. So that's where it goes. Jails and patrol. Also, that's district attorney, community justice, which is parole probation. And an interesting fact that uh, basically in Jackson County, and I think it holds true in most communities, uh, about one in 10 people have been in jail or are on parole probation. So think about that next time you're in the restaurant, sitting there enjoying your meal. <laughs> think about it next time you're sitting there in the uh, movie theater, you know, in the Star Wars movie theater. 10% of the people in that <laughs> are either on parole or probation or have been in jail. All right, so if you want to solve. <laughs> that's not just Jackson County, okay? That's nationwide. All right. Um, but if you really want to solve the budget problem, there it is. 
right? The people just did what they were supposed to do. Problem solved. <laughs> we spend the majority of our money taking care of those people. All right, now, um, we do have to have a gym. Jackson County, by statute, has to have a gym. Anytime somebody is cited under ORS, which is usually felons, anything to the traffic ticket, then what happens is the cities, they, they pick up those people, they drive them down to the jail, and they drop them off. And then they're the county's responsibility. And we can't charge the city for them dropping off those, those criminals. Okay? We have the only jail in town. Mandated we have to take care of. Um, we do not have to have patrol in the unincorporated area. But since safety is one of the biggest things that the commissioners you know, like to, to talk about, um, keeping their citizens safe, then we spend a lot of money on patrol as well in the unincorporated area. Um, this 5% over here is basically the internal services. What are the internal service departments? Anybody? No? That's yeah. not in there? They have the services to make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to do, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, things like the Board of Commissioners, County Administrator, but it's also information technology. It's those uh, organizations or those departments inside the organization who only have customers inside the organization. So payroll, right? Finance, etc. So those are the internal services. Or Sean, oh, and see that. Okay. So there we go. Um, so that's internal services, basically 5%. And actually, those services are also charged back to the uh, dedicated funds. Okay, so for example, the airport, when um, they do their budget, we figure out how much time it is that we spend. We spend on them each year. We can charge them back for that time that we spend. Uh, from an administrative standpoint, from a human resources standpoint, to figure out from the finance department how many paychecks we how many paychecks we uh, distribute for them, how many checks we distribute for them. Um, I mean, you, you name it, we count it, and we can charge them back for it. Um, and that is important to know how to do those chargeback systems because, um, so for example, when you do federal money, and that airport revenue is considered air, uh, federal money, then you have to be able to stand up to the federal calculations. The feds fed have some laws about how you can charge back uh, to that organization. So you have to be able to live up to that, or to prove up to that. 10% uh, other, we'll come back to that. 10% library. So I told you that we closed our library. We did find a way to open them again, and basically, that's this right here. We had a big enough rainy day reserve or a big enough fund balance that we put ourselves on a plan. We've got three years left in that plan. Um, so that we're operating the libraries so that the federal government can bring people together, the loggers and the people, the spotted owl people, um, bring them together so we can start logging again on the ONC uh, timber mines, which is a contribution directly to the county general fund. So um, we opened it up again with those reserves, and uh, right now we're out of balance by that much. But believe me, I broadcast that loud and clear to everybody. I know we've got about a three-year plan left, and then we're going to have to do something or we're going to have to close it out. Um, total allocation. So libraries are functioning, and actually, we're also spending about a million dollars in that, and that's part of this right here for development services. And that's our zone. So in Oregon, uh, the state, the master plan, the whole state. Um, quite obnoxious. <laughs> and they basically rule what can be built where. Um, when they master plan Oregon, they basically said, okay, this is far, this is forest, this is farm use, this is open space reserve, this area you can build in. Um, and they require us, Canada, to maintain that zoning. Um, and so anytime anybody wants to build anything in the unincorporated area, 
then it's a very lengthy process in order to get them authorization to do it. So they designated, for example, a farm, a piece of land that's uh, exclusive farm use. That means it can only be used for farm use, doesn't matter who buys it. But they did provide a little bit of an exemption. They said, okay, we realize that if you're going to have a farm way out there in the stick, you have to be able to have a house. Right? But in order to have a house, then it has to be an area that uh, basically can support agriculture. So wait a minute, it, it was exclusive farm use, but it can't support agriculture, right? So it has to be rock. Well, okay, <laughs> you can build your house on rock inside the exclusive farm use, um, but in order for you to build your house out there, you have to have water and you have to have septic. So where are you gonna get water if you're on top of a rock? And how are you gonna build a septic system on top of rock? <laughs> for you to build a septic system, you have to have nice, soft soil. <laughs> right. Okay, so it becomes pretty tricky, and people are pretty upset when they come to the county with this beautiful tract of land they bought out in the forest, and they want to put their beautiful, picturesque house right here, um, and we tell them, yes, I can. Right. <laughs> and that's our responsibility, that's all we can. Um, so we do try to jump through those loopholes as much as we um, so there is development in the unincorporated area, but again, that's our responsibility and the state mandates that we take care of it. So it's a challenge here. Um, we talked about libraries, 6% help. I told you that uh, basically health and human services, most of that service is provided, provided by us on a contract with the state. About half of that, 6%, is spent on things that Uh, is spent on things that the state requires us to do, but they don't give us money to do. So, for example, H1N1, H1N1 virus came through Oregon. Jackson County's responsibility to take care of communicable diseases. So, our, all that we did to, to fight off that, um, all that we did to do publications to help curb it, so on and so forth, the county had responsibility. All right, but the other half of that is for So when the person, prisoner is dropped off at the county jail, so the city medford went out, rounded somebody up, dropped them off at our jail, um, sometimes they struggle, right? They don't want to be arrested, so they struggle with the office. They kind of get beat up. <laughs> they aren't gentle. So they drop them up with us, they got bruises, they got bones, they got bad teeth. Um, the state, as soon as they hit our doors, cuts off their services. The federal government, once they hit our doors, they cut off their services as well. So, if they have a broken tooth that needs to be taken care of, and we have to hold them for jail, or hold, hold them over for trial, then we have to take care of their tooth. Right? They have a heart condition, they have whatever it is, then the county has to, hold, has to take care of them. So, Again, we can't charge that back to anybody else. It's our responsibility. Right? Questions about that? Yeah. I think cruel and inhumane punishment is to lock somebody up and they have a fight. So that's basically it. Um, back to the other assessment and taxation. That's a, a big part of that as well. Um, the county is responsible to assess and collect all property taxes for all the taxing jur jurisdictions inside. So the cities figure out how much property tax they need. They take it over to the assessor, certify to him. He basically has to assess that you know, property out or that property tax to everybody collect it. And then we have to send it back to the cities. Our responsibility, in fact, we, it's, again, it's very heavily regulated. Um, the responsibility that, frankly, the state should take over. We tried to give it back to the state, and the state said, okay, if we do it, then we'll do it, but we'll figure out how much it costs, and we'll charge it back for it. Well, it might come to that pretty soon. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, anyway, for right now, we take care of that. In fact, there was a court case in Oregon that uh, basically said that uh, the first dollar you collect in property tax needs to go towards funding assessment for those in other jurisdictions. And we can't hold that property tax for a while, collect interest income off of it, and then send them the amount that we collected for them. In 
fact, if you do collect any interest income off of it, then you have to figure out how much of that is their share and give that to them with the amount that you collected for their property. All right. So questions about this? Okay. Well, that's a pretty good introduction to Jackson County, which kind of services we have to provide, where we provide them. Um, this is a map of ONC lands. That's kind of an interesting story. I don't know if we want to take a lot of time talking about that. But this is a checkerboard pattern of property that came up through basically the I-5 corridor. Um, what happened is, um, it's a long story, but back in the uh, middle 1800s, you know, the federal government wanted a railroad to go through this area. So they entered into a deal with the Oregon California Railroad to build a railroad. In order to fund it, they gave them alternating sections of land, sections of square, one square mile. Um, alternating means checkerboard pattern. Right? So they gave them that checkerboard pattern and said, take that land and sell it to people who want to come from east, out west, buy that property. They set the price at $2.50 an acre. Um, they said, sell it to them, and that way you can fund your revenue. Well, shortly after they started that process, then the people who the railroad figured out that that the timber on that property was worth a lot more than two dollars and fifty cents. So they started logging and taking the uh, timber off of it and then trying to sell the property. Um, they also figured out that they only had to sell it once for two dollars and fifty cents an acre, and then they could do anything with it they wanted. The property owner after that. So what they did was they would go down to the bars here in Denver, get people drunk. They would sell them the property for two dollars and fifty cents, and they would buy it back for. Plus the alcohol. Um, and then they could do anything they wanted, right? Yeah. Um, they also think about migration. They uh, entered into agreements with the uh, banks, and one of them was right here in Jacksonville, just to the side of Medford. Um, you migrate, migrate out uh, west, you go to the bank and say, okay, bank, I want to get a loan so I can buy property. Well, what you can do with the property? I'm Okay, so how are you going to think that, right? So they didn't get into the business of loan loans. Well, what happened is the people who were running the railroad back east, our people, sent them out there, entered into an agreement with the banks that they would pay those loans off. So people show up, I want a loan, they buy it, they sell it back to the railroad. So then they can do anything they want. Uh, well, the federal government found out that was happening, and so they basically So, now, you have to understand how the budget all works. At the time, it was total cost of services less other revenue equals your property taxes, right? And that's the formula. Total services, cost of services, minus other revenues, which are things like fees, you know, et cetera. Um, the balance of it is property tax. So, by this time, there was a pretty good sized population base out there, but all this property was on the tax rolls. So the railroads were actually paying property taxes off. Well, when the federal government took it back, then next slide. That's what it looks like in Jackson County. Half of the value of the property went off the tax roll. So, think about it. <laughs> Again, that basic formula, total cost of services, other revenues, property tax. At that time, they didn't care about rate per thousand or anything like that. They cared about the total amount of uh, property tax required to provide the services. So, here in Jackson County, that property all goes off the tax rolls. Your property tax was low. Right? And these were farmers. Um, they couldn't afford to build amount of <coughs> property tax. So, uh, basically, our senators worked out a deal with the LNC, 
happened is we basically entered into an agreement and said, okay, so half the value of that property for that timber when it's cut goes to the local uh, governments, to the counties, and the other half of it uh, goes to the BLM to manage that forest land. Um, and by the way, what's the number one um, goal of all farmers? Increase yield, right? Yield per acre. So that's what they do. Okay? They actually went after it. And um, so right now, there is way more timber out there in those areas than there were when it basically went into DLM management. But, um, Spotted owl issue did stop logging in those areas because they said no spotted owls live in low growth areas and uh, we need to protect their habitat so they stopped logging. So the federal government gave us a guarantee instead of, first of all, they said it would take us about a year to get this figured out. That was back in 1990. <laughs> then they said, okay, wait a minute, it's going to take a little longer than we thought. So they gave us a three year guarantee, then they gave us a five year guarantee, then they seven-year guarantee. They gave us a four-year guarantee and we're done. <laughs> because this year they said, no more. <clears throat> so that's what our revenue looked like in this last year. Public law 110-343. I'm sure that you're all aware of the fact that it came from the His predecessor was public law 106-393. And it was called the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination. Important to note that just a portion of that money on that act was supposed to go to support uh, county schools because there was no more logging in this area in Jackson County. And we had 12, I think it was 12 mills operating when in 1990, now we're down to two mills operating. Uh, but they said, look, the impact this has had on the community, we need to get more money. But the senators didn't know about the Equalization Act, the School Equalization Act, the Student Funding Equalization Act, which basically meant when we gave, gave this money to the schools, then that reduced the amount of money that the state had to give the schools. So it had the impact of basically increasing the amount of money that the state had to spend on other things. So none of it went to help the schools. That's how they found out about that's why we got to this year, which is a completely different formula or anything before that was based on the amount of timber that was in Jackson County when they did the initial cruise back in 1895. Okay, so every time they cut down a piece of, of, of timber, cut down a tree, Jackson County got 15.67% because that's how much timber Jackson County had in Jackson County as a percentage. Of. So it didn't matter where they went. But now, again, um, they were giving us basically, I mean it was, I think it was in the vicinity of $500 million to split up amongst the ONC counties. Okay? And that's coming right out of the federal government, general fund. Well, um, we fought the fight so long, basically everybody else caught on. And so they changed the formula, it's no longer based on that. Now it's based on um, population, unemployment rates, um, so on and so forth. So poverty level, under, under poverty level. And now it's a count, or it's a state or a United States country level formula, not just a formula for us. And now everybody's sharing that poverty when it gets distributed. So things change. Those brown lines are how much money we would have got if we would have been living off of and the reason I show those lines there is because that's the amount that we used to, we call that portion of our budget the operating money. We call the difference between that line and the top non-operating revenue. We put that aside, created a rainy day fund, and we're slowly spending down that money to keep our lives. So, there you go. That's Jackson County's budget. And it's, um, time for general questions. I hope that was interesting to you. I flew through it as fast as I could. <laughs> so, any questions?
Going back to the non-dedicated funds um, and the, how it was broken down in, in Jackson County, is it going to look similar in other cities or in counties, or is this that, does that just de depend on what the needs of those individual counties are? Um, it's going to look different from county to county. It's going to look different from state to state because different states require different services than other counties. Counties are really an extension of the state. And that's in, I think, every state in the union. Um, an extension means that they have a lot of control over it. When a city forms, incorporates, they develop their own home rule charter, and basically then they can do anything it is that they want to do. There's only certain, in, in Oregon, they have to have, there's a list of services that have to be provided or should be provided by a city, and they have to be able to check off four of them. Okay? So if they're providing all four of those, then they can Incorporate doesn't matter, mean that they have to continue to provide those services, um, but they at least have to provide those services initially, and then they can do what they want with the rest of them. So it really does kind of, like I said, depend. But overall, in general, the big chunk that goes to safety, yeah, and that's why I say your sheriff or your uh, police chief is going to be somebody that you're going to be dealing with an awful lot because they control a big portion of that. So that's what you get on a county road. You don't get that inside the city limit. So basically what happens is those roads deteriorate um, to the point where most people don't want to drive. <laughs> there's, there's examples of that uh, in my biography. I talked about the unincorporated area of White City and uh, an urban rural district. The county did go in and develop uh, those streets to city standards so that they could incorporate. Um, and that was just not valid, and it was just uh, rejected, overwhelmed. So, we'll take care of those streets for as long as we can. <laughs> then we'll deteriorate. Um, and the same thing happens with the law enforcement, right? So instead of having your own police chief now, um, you're not getting, you're not paying the county anymore to provide their services. So you're going to live with the service or the level of service that they have in the unincorporated area. And in fact, now that's going to be spread into your city's city uh, area as well. So you're going to get significantly less service than you had before. Our parks department, every park has to be completely self-funded, which means it's fees every time you go into a, a park. Most of our parks are up in the mountains, on the rivers, those kind of things, so that we can control access. There's no way to do that on a city park, right? So your parks are going to basically turn into weed patches unless you find somebody interested enough to mow it. That's basically what happens. Also, you give up your right to zone inside your city limits, and then you fall back on the county zone issue that they have to do. Now, there are laws in place as far as uh, what you can invest in. And in Oregon, it's, uh, uh, it's pretty strict. When we invest our money, because you saw we have some pretty good-sized fund balances, then we invest it first uh, for security, the very first security. 
second liquidity. Right? So when are we going to need that money? What's our cash flow going to look like? And third, we need it. So way down the list. Um, and that's why we end up with just basically 1% interest. services, you know, health and human services, we're the ones who are providing that. So um, we're doing everything that we can to basically make life better for the citizens in Santa County. That's, that's basically what keeps me coming back. Um, and frankly, a very rewarding. Um, I showed you the organizational structure in Jackson County. One day I'm dealing with the airport, the next day I'm dealing with, and sometimes in the same day, uh, dealing with the sheriff's department and stuff that they have to do. Um, there's the business side of it, so I get to, I review all the contracts before they go on an agenda, make sure that it's a good business plan for Jackson County, um, and also a good financial deal for Jackson County. I really enjoy that part of it. Um, you know, just the things that come, come past my desk are just very um, fascinating, entertaining, uh, and sometimes you might. Right now we're uh, in the process, we've had uh, some historical properties here in the city of Jacksonville, our county seats inside the city of Medford. Uh, the original courthouse that was built in Jacksonville plus the Beekman Bank, which is the original bank in Jackson County, was tied up in all this O&C stuff. Um, uh, the Beekman House, which was the owner of the bank, his house is there. Uh, there's a Catholic rectory. So the county owns those historical properties. Um, and we've been leasing those out to the Southern Oregon Historical Society. We have been maintaining them. So right now we're working with the Southern Oregon Historical Society, the Jacksonville Heritage Society, the Friends of St. Joseph's, the uh, Art uh, Council in Jacksonville, uh, the City of Jacksonville, we're trying to get those properties and the titles and everything else cleaned up so that we can basically bring them back to the county possession so that we can give them to the city. It's been just very interesting to try and deal with all those people, all those moving parts as they're accomplished. So, and then, so what would be the most challenging about that? That sounds fun. I don't know if it's also well, the most challenging. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the most challenging as well because you've got your board of commissioners and you're saying, you know, get this done today, but you've got two lawyers, or five lawyers, or ten lawyers, you know, trying to go back at it and everybody's protecting their own interests. So that's a challenge. Um, HR issues, always a challenge, because um, you know, there's 10% of the population out there that are really bad actors, and no matter how much you do, <laughs> background checks and those kind of things, you get them as employees, okay? <laughs> They're coming. <laughs> You're going to get to deal with them. <laughs> so um, you just have to go through, through those processes to make sure that you take care of them. 